Good morning. My name is John Locke. I am pastor of St. James Lutheran Church here in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We are delighted and thrilled that you have decided to join us and engage in worship through means of YouTube and our YouTube channel, and we give thanks that you are present with us. Following our worship today on Sunday, approximately 1145, we will be having a congregational meeting. We'll be doing that by Zoom. And so you'll need to either uh, log in to Zoom through your iPhone or your uh, cell phone, also by your laptop or your iPad or your computer, and uh, join that meeting. You'll find information about that meeting on our website where you can just click on a link. If you can't do it by a computer, you can do it by phone. There's also a, uh, there's also a place where you can uh, just, just make a phone call. It will log you into the Zoom system. You will have to enter a password, uh, about a six or seven digit code, and that will allow you to be part of the meeting where you can hear what's being said. Uh, people will recognize that you're present and you'll be heard if you want to speak. So uh, please give attention to that on Sunday. We'll need a quorum to have our business meeting and that's about 35 or 40 people. So we'll also have a second session at 3.45. Uh, those who are present for our Vesper services, you're invited to come early and uh, be a part of that in our parking lot area before Vespers. And we will also be by Zoom there as well. So between the two sessions, we would hope to have a full quorum. Hopefully you've had all your questions answered. If not, uh, give a call this morning before the meeting and uh, to one of the council members to make sure we have the questions answered before you have a vote. We begin our worship today by using words of confession to God, and we hear God's wonderful words of forgiveness and inclusion and restoration. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held by captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by God's peace, Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has set me up to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes, 
the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and the offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth springs forth its shoots, and as a garden cause what it is sown in it to spring, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Here ends the reading. Psalm 126, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then were we like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we were glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the Negev. Those who sowed with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. A reading from the Gospel of John in the first chapter. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? John confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? They asked. He answered, no. Then they said to him, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And John said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked John, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was a teenager, I, was in a, I belonged to a Methodist church with my family. 
And one of the things I got involved in as part of being a teenager was a movement at that time throughout the Methodist Church. It was a lay, uh, non-clergy, parachurch kind of organization, and they did what they called lay witness missions. A particular church would host a team, and one of the important parts of the weekend was various and sundry people from the mission team, the lay witness team, would give their witness, would give their testimony is the word that we used at the time. And that is, what is it about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection impacts my life and changes who I am and changes what I do and how I do things? It's more about where is God in all of this action around my life than how does God try to fit God's self into my life? So being a witness... Offering your testimony, sharing your faith story. It's about what you see. It's about what you hear. It's about what you experience in the sights and sounds and actions around you. It's about where is God in the story of your life. I've been enjoying a lot of Christmas music, a lot of Christmas carols, much more earlier than ever before, probably because of the pandemic and stuff going on these days probably much like many of you. I've begun, to dis I've begun to discover, though, that a lot of these Christmas carols really are witness songs. They're witness stories. They're s songs like, um, oh, here's one of the Advent favorites. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. Vixen and Blitzen and all of his reindeer pulling on the reins. It's a story, isn't it? It's a story of someone seeing an event, describing what they have witnessed. Or how about, away in a manger, no crib for his bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. Isn't that too a witness song? Something someone saw, perhaps the innkeeper or the innkeeper's spouse or someone who is walking by, or a shepherd. And speaking of shepherd, the shepherd comes with the drummer boy, doesn't it? Come, they told me, there's a newborn king to see. This is my story about what my encounter with God is like in the small child in the manger. Now, there are many others. There's the one about a grandparent who got involved in an accident with a reindeer. Maybe not totally appropriate for worship. Or, I saw Mommy kissing Santa Claus underneath the mistletoe last night. It's a witness song, isn't it? A song about a story someone saw or heard or witnessed. Or, or about the shepherds. They look it up. And saw a star shining in the east beyond them far. Stories about things people saw or witnessed. Now we've heard the story of the coming of the Christ child over and over and over again. From our parents, from our grandparents, even from our great-grandparents. It's the same story that John proclaims and preaches about, and in the Gospel of John, this John that we're talking about, in other Gospels known as John the Baptist, in the Gospel of John, we could call him John the Witness. John comes as a witness to the light. And the priests and Levites from Jerusalem are sent out into the wilderness to find John and find out what he's talking about, find out what he's doing, and to report back to their superiors and they come and ask, who are you? And John says, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not he. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. I can tell you who I am not. I'm not the one who's coming after me. I'm not the one who's coming who's more powerful than I am. I'm not the one who is so much above me, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoelaces. Me? Me? I'm no one. 
I'm just one who says, in the wilderness of life, it's time to prepare for the coming of Jesus the Messiah. And John is a witness. He's heard, he's experienced from God about Jesus. Now, we're not given a lot of insight about the relationship between John the witness and Jesus. We know, of course, because of other Gospels, that Jesus and John are related to one another. So we also know that they're only months apart in age. We also know that these cousins live in a fairly close proximity to to one another, within probably a day's journey, which in those days would have been fairly close. But we don't know what their interaction is. We don't know how well they knew each other, how much they spent the night with one another, or went to summer camp together, or played games together. But I got a feeling they knew each other. I just got a feeling. Whatever that relationship is, it is strong enough that John knows and believes and witnesses to the divine nature of Jesus. He tells folks that Jesus, not by name, but he tells folks that the kingdom of heaven is going to come. The kingdom of heaven is coming near. There is someone coming that's so much more powerful than I am. Be ready for him. Repent and prepare for his coming. And in John's gospel, John the witness is not talking about a baby. John the witness is talking about a grown man about an individual who comes with strength and power to walk and talk and heal and preach and to proclaim this gospel of belonging, of loving. Now, we're called in a similar way to be witnesses to Jesus' power, to God's presence, to the Spirit's activity among us. You see, I know now some things I didn't know when I was 15. I know that our testimony... Our witness about God begins and ends with God. Because you see, John defines himself not by who he is, but by who he is not. And so his claim is like us. In order to be a credible witness, we don't claim much about ourselves. We claim about what we saw, about what we heard, about what we experienced. Think about the story later in John's gospel about the blind man being healed, blind from birth. He didn't know who Jesus was. He didn't know how Jesus caused him to be able to see. And the religious leaders persecuted this man because he couldn't tell them how Jesus healed him. He could only tell them what he knew, what he experienced, what he had witnessed. And once the miracle had happened, what he had seen. John doesn't give a lot of whys or hows about Jesus. He simply speaks of his experiences. He is the voice of someone crying in the wilderness. Not just simply the geographical wilderness, but in the emotional wilderness. That's what we experience today in our time of Advent. We need these voices of Hope to a lost and wandering people, that's us. Wandering lost in the night. Wandering in a wilderness of emotions that we can't explain, that we can't always find our way through, that cause pain and agony and confusion. Now, these other voices that came, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Mary, and others, They speak of the Lord anointing them and anointing others to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to release, proclaim release to the prisoners. They are called to speak about God comforting those who mourn, rebuilding the ruins of their lives. Just think about the tragedies and the difficulties of your own life. When we think about all that we've been through in the last year in our country and in the world through pandemic and social unrest and natural disasters and political unrest, then think about 
adding to all of that individual and family issues, like the death of a loved one, or an illness, or an addiction, or a divorce, or tremendous guilt, or the sin that separates us from God, or others, even ourselves. We ask for answers. We ask for explanations. That's what these priests and Levites did. They want answers to their questions. That will sustain them. How is it? Why is it? When is it? Where is it? Why are things the way they are? When will it get better? When will this, these dark times of our lives change to sunlight and dawn? When does the difficulties and challenges of COVID begin to shift and change into opportunities and return to hopefulness? When is it that things will become possible? You see, these questions that we ask in these challenging, difficult wilderness times, they, they don't get, it, get us through it. It's a word of hope that gets us through these difficult times. Hope doesn't make a difficult time easy, but hope makes difficult times passable. Hope makes life possible. Hope reminds us that it won't always be like this. Hope reminds us that there's a light and a life that's coming to us an Advent hope, the hope that John speaks about, that hope reminds us that it's already here among us. The child is already here. The child is already born. The child has already grown and preached and talked and walked among us. And the child has died and risen again. And that's the hope that brings us life. Hope isn't easy. I find myself oftentimes speaking of hope and not necessarily having it. Times when life is tough and difficult, challenging, even routine sometimes, we get our head down, focused on the journey ahead of us, and we forget to look up because that's where we'll see Jesus. That's where we'll see God granting us forgiveness. That's where we'll find God offering us a friend to accompany us on the journey. That's where we'll find God offering us some symbol or some act of hope, act of joy, some thing that gives us an answer. It's those are the things that we then practice. You see, hope is something that we have to focus upon. In our lesson today that we didn't read, we didn't read the second lesson, which is from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And Paul writes about rejoicing. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Seek out God. Give thanks. That's what hope leads us to. Hope leads us to a life of rejoicing, of life of praying without ceasing, a life of giving thanks in all circumstances. And as we practice this life of hopefulness and rejoicing and prayer and thanksgiving, it enables us to hear better. It enables us to see better. It, it enables us to witness better. And we can remind others that there is hopefulness in the land. Now these are the voices of hope. Just as the author of John's Gospel begins, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word has come to dwell among us. And we rejoice. The Word has come to give us hope. The Word has come to instill in us this power of hopefulness 
so that we can be witnesses that look beyond the circumstances in which we find ourselves to the God who fills those circumstances. That's hope. It opens our eyes to see the one who is coming and it prepares our heart to welcome the one who is already among us. It makes straight the way of the Lord. Hope is not just a feeling, but it's an orientation. It's an attitude of our life. It is a way of seeing. It allows us to recognize and know the Christ who is already here, but not yet here. You see, hope doesn't change the circumstances of our life, but it does change us. And changing us changes our perspective, and that changes everything. And hope, hope, my friends, empowers us to be witnesses to all those around us, to the coming of the Lord, to tell the story of how God has come into our life and become the center of our life. And as the center of our life impacts all that we are, all that we do, all that we are becoming, may the hopefulness of Advent, the joy of Christmas, be in your life this day and forever, being the center so that you may share hope with others. Amen.
we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of power and might, shine your radiance and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God of preachers and messengers, you have entrusted your church with the work of proclaiming good news. Strengthen the witness of bishops, pastors, deacons, church musicians, lay leaders, and all people who contribute their prayers and talents to the public worship, artists and altar guild and ushers and greeters and lectors. Embed your word in their hearts. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of all peoples and nations, you plant us as your oaks of righteousness and ask us to care for one another. Be present with the leaders of every nation as they govern. As we near the conclusion of this election cycle in our country, bring healing and peace. Bring us a spirit of righteousness that your goodness and mercy is revealed through our actions. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of the powerful and God of the helpless, you clothe us with strength when our spirits are weak and weary. Bestow your spirit upon this congregation and empower us to comfort the people who turn to us in times of need. Offer your healing strength to those who are sick, anxious, weary, to those who we remember before you in our hearts this day. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gather together as God's people and through the Holy Spirit, let's pray as God, as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior, fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit, guide your journey now and forever. Amen.
Go in peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.